So I got started in community work two and a half years ago. And when I got started, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing, but I'm more comfortable about the fact that I don't know what I'm doing. And one of the key people that really showed me the fact that I didn't know what I was doing and not in a bad way, but showing me the light is the person who I have with me today. Alex Roll is an amazing community person in the DevRel side, in, in the community space, doing all kinds of stuff, who is a mentor unknowingly and unwillingly when I got started with the community. But we're going to hear about her experiences and the knowledge that she's bringing to the table based on the things that she's been doing in lots of different spaces. So Alex, welcome. Can you just give us a little bit of background about who you are and how you got into this crazy world? For sure. So um, I feel like everyone's got a kind of odd community story. No one, like, it's never a straight path to community. You end up there one way or another. But um, my kind of odd path is my degree is in informatics, which is kind of a generalist degree. It's a little bit of everything, a little technical, a little human-centered design. And so each role that I've come from out of that has been focusing on the things I like best and moving more toward that part of the job. Uh, which pretty naturally ended me up in community. Uh, I went through a couple technical dev roles and then went through Microsoft as both a support engineer and then a little later as like Twitter and social support and then landed in community, built my uh, built a team at Microsoft for that. And then now I'm out in startups doing community programs from the ground up. Fantastic. With that in mind, doing community programs from the ground up. Where does one start when they're starting a community? Well, you start with uh, the most passionate people, whether that's internals or people in your community that have been there from day one. Uh, each program's a little bit different, so I don't have a nice little soundbite answer for you, but it depends. I'm going to have a lot of answers like that, Bart. <laughs> That's okay. That's understandable. And I do think though that without passionate people, it's going to be really hard. And that's something oh, that absolutely. I realize as well. It's not that you're, you know, creating dependencies, but you need to empower the folks who can do the things that you can't do. You know, very well, I don't have a technical background. So my ability, but there are other things that because of not having that background, I can ask a lot of questions that might seem really basic, but it gets conversation started. I only realized that I would say much later, but having that core of folks that you know you can rely on and you don't want to, you know, you have to respect the fact that they're giving their time. And so it needs to be meaningful for them and, you know, make sense and not too much of an ask and more of an offer. But I think that's a great point about without, without having some kind of passionate folks that are going to be there to help you out uh, in terms of support later down the road, you know, ambassador programs, things of that nature um, can be, can be a part of the story, but okay. So in terms of building communities though, what are, you know, what's your style, what's your approach? What are the questions that you like to ask a lot when you're in that, when you're in that position, when something's getting started out to not bite off more than you can chew, to make it scalable, to make it sustainable. So first things first, just embrace the uncertainty. Every community is going to throw you some curveballs, and you're going to have to roll with it. But the early thing that I look at is like, what's the coolest thing about this platform, this product, this service, this community that's gathered here? Whether it's, hey, we're doing something that nobody else is doing, or we're enabling something that's a really cool use case. Um, that's a little bit of the marketing thing, you know, like, what, where's the wow factor? But what you're really looking for is what's that nugget that's going to resonate with people, whether it's the product itself or the people around it. Um, and also, like, who are the people that care the most about it? And sometimes that's going to be internals. It's going to be the CEO. It's going to be that dev that's willing to crack out a support ticket uh, and, like, actually talk to customers. Sometimes it's one of your community members that's just always there and always asking questions and like that's the base from which you can build and like you said though that uncertainty is going to be there and i think that's what's frustrating for a lot of folks is because of needing or wanting to copy paste sort of structural elements and metrics and there are lots of community metrics and there are lots of ways to gather them but i think that understand there's a very you know the art and science aspect that there's a very strong human part of this that, like you said is going to be different in each in each environment and so you just have to you know based on what you have available in terms of resources and commitment how do you leverage that to help the community get closer you know towards the objectives that it might have in terms of things that you see 
common errors or mistakes that you see people making or that you yourself uh, have made? What are some that might stand out? Ooh, a big one is expecting overnight results. Like your first thousand followers is harder than your second million, right? You gotta, you gotta start somewhere. And some of that means that you're going to have an initiative that just fails. Um, my absolute worst one is um, actually at my current company, uh, which is a telecom company. And it's, hey, we're going to do this office hours thing. We're going to make an open forum for people to come in and ask us questions. And one of the first ones nobody showed up to from external, of course. And I, you know, rally all the internals. They're all here. They're ready to answer questions. Not a soul. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the initiative was bad. So it's not like, oh, let's scrap this. It might mean that you have to move it from Wednesday to Tuesday and back an hour. It might mean that you need to advertise in different spaces. Um, that initiative is still rolling at this company and it gets people now. So it just kind of depends, right? Uh, and knowing when to like cut your losses versus when you need to keep putting the time and the sweat equity in this case into it. Um, and especially early on, your greatest resource as a CM is like your own time. You're the one that's taking the time and taking the energy and trying to get things out there and talking to people. And it's all ultimately comes down to what you can do to make it happen. Yeah. And I remember actually when you told me going back to the, you know, the, the first part of your answer there, you were the first person, well, the only person who told me that your first thousand Slack members, Twitter followers, it's, it's a hard slug. And you just got to know that and, you know, embrace the suck like that. It's, it's going to be tough. And then afterwards it gets its own momentum, sort of almost inertia. Folks get out there and start talking about it. If you're not the only one who's talking about it, you know, as a loudspeaker for this community and you need to get a sort of organic we, we say growth of, of conversations around what's happening there. I always say, why is someone going to join? Why are they going to stay? And why are they going to tell their friends to come? That last one being, what do I need to do? What's this cool thing that we do that's going to get us to that third part where I don't have to be going out? And, and I, of course, as a community manager, you're going to be going out and, get, and getting folks to come in. But when your community members are, are also doing that with you, as a, as a joint effort, um, that's where I think you know the magic kind of starts to happen. Yeah, and that like, moment when you're not the only one talking, you're not the only one promoting, is so huge. It's such a big win. It is, and I think almost as a goal is like, what do I need to do for that to happen? What are the actions that I need to take? It's something that I didn't realize, thinking like, oh no, it's just like it's my job to be out there like all the time doing this. Like, no, no, actually, your job is to make sure that you are. Uh, you know, there are lots of other people doing that because if it's just you that, and, and also realizing that a community shouldn't be too attached just to one person, because that can become dangerous for the community's health itself, um, because you know, changes happen and people leave, people move on. And so understanding what's best for the community isn't necessarily what's best, you know, for the, that the community manager is just trying to elevate themselves to a you know, superstardom or that there needs to be something safe and manageable that can be uh, maintained by, by other folks. I guess another thing that, you know, that you also mentioned there is that, yeah, these things don't happen overnight and it takes time. And that's what's tough because of a traditional sort of approach of expecting, well, if we're doing this, I need to see that. And like I said, there are metrics and there are things that can be, and it's fair that there needs to be transparency, but I think a lot of community managers work has to be around educating folks about what this is and what this means. When I go into a company doing community consulting, First thing I ask is, how many of you have started a community before? And generally, not many hands go up. And in the same way, because of working in video production, how many of you have ever made a video? And not many hands go up, and maybe one or two. And they're like, okay, can you show me? It's, I'm not saying that to say like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. But, well, kind of in a, in a nice way. But to say like, okay, well, this is how I make videos. And maybe somebody else does it in a different way, but so that people understand the process. I think with community, there are different, there's just a lot of natural lack of understanding, lack of experience. So then it's, it's only normal that people are going to say, well, we've done everything else with this mindset or this approach. So we're going to do the same thing here. And communities need different things that don't necessarily apply to other areas. What are some of those things that you think people often might be missing out on? Uh, so kind of as you were talking through that, I was thinking about uh, one of the common ones I see is that in a lot of other spaces, throwing money at the problem works. Like it is possible to 
just run better ads with more money and things like that. Uh, community is not really a money solvable problem. And when you've been approaching most other things, which I see especially at startups, uh, with a money solvable problem mindset, community does not work for that. Um, some of the things it needs more, it just needs attention more than anything. If the folks of your company aren't willing to commit to listening to the feedback that you get from community or like making changes based on what you see, uh, the community can tell. It's People are smart. They detect marketing. They detect that it's a one-way street. So if you're not willing to establish that two-way street where you're talking to your community and also hearing back from them, that's ultimately what's going to cause it to fail. Absolutely agree. Create lots of opportunities for people to give feedback. Be open to it. Invite it. And and make it really easy for people to let you know what you can improve because you don't have, you know, the, the single source of truth or the keys to everything. And, and, and so creating an environment, designing elements and experiences and spaces, not, and, you know, surveys are one way to do it, but one-to-one -one conversations, like you said, with those core folks who, you know, that can give you direct feedback and they also care about this. So they want it to improve. Those are great ways to, to get lots of different sources of information in order to help you make better decisions. There are, you know, different trends just in the time that I've been involved in community. I've seen, you know, Discord wasn't even necessarily as big when I got started. Now, you know, we have these debates about Slack versus Discord, lots of different things. You were recently at Developer Week. What were some of the things that people were talking about? Because you got to interact with a fair amount of community folks. Yeah, the one of the big ones that I heard from a lot of people was everyone's kind of gotten used to online events now for the last couple of years. That's kind of where our, the space is. So now transitioning back into in-person events, it's one of the big things people are worried about is keeping that online community that they've now you know, spent the last two, three years building. And especially if they had to shift an in-person community into an online community, shifting it back is significantly more difficult. People are in different places in their life. People have different priorities and goals, and there's a lot of different comfort levels as well. So getting folks back into physical spaces is a big challenge. And also like still keeping that space for your hybrid model or for your online people that may have joined the community and aren't physically close to anyone else. Agreed. I think with that, and as you said previously, you know, with doing an in-person meetup, some people, because if they do an online one, they're like, oh, we got 180 views on YouTube or we got this and that. And doing an in-person one, if 180 people go to a, an in-person meetup, particularly when it's the first or second time, you maybe have some really good speakers or lots of free beer. Or I don't know what, but it's, it's something that a good in-person meetup or online can have five people. If there are five people that are really passionate and committed and interested, they're going to enjoy the fact that they actually get to have deeper and longer conversations with the speakers and with other, you know, uh, attendees, audience, uh, folks in the audience, than if it's, you know, just a sort of, you know, uh, let's say a more typical in-person event with, you know, 100, 150 people, things of that nature. So I think that's a really good point. What about the fact in community right now with what we're seeing in the economy and what might be shifting there as companies really have to be focused on business goals? Is there anything that, that came up in developer week about that? Uh, yeah, I talked to a couple of people that are having sort of a similar space to me where it's uh, you're starting to get asked in this community, like, how is this driving sales? And that is a heck of a question um, and not one that I think is a good idea, but let me expand on that. Um, community pretty naturally does lead into your funnel. Like that, that's just a truth. Community is a top of funnel activity. I understand that, but uh, measuring individual community activities in terms of like, how does it commit, uh, how does it inform your funnel or like, how does it directly drive sales is asking for your community initiatives to fail because um, again, it's like that hard marketing. Um, if you're turning your community spaces into a place just to push people into spending more, you're losing the like secret sauce that is like your core community. And that kind of feeds into another thing that I see a lot is people don't understand that community is not just your customers. It's a much broader group of people. It's people that talk about you, have heard about you. They might be your competitors. They might be other folks that are working in the space that may never buy your product, but they talk about you or they send people in your direction directly or indirectly. So pushing all of that into the sales funnel means that you're you're losing all the 
like good bits and a lot of that top of funnel activity. That's an excellent point. And along with that, or I think inside that is a fact and a misunderstanding from a lot of folks about the 99-1 rule of, you know, 90% of the folks that are there are just lurkers who are never going to post anything publicly. They might DM somebody occasionally behind the scenes. And, you know, it's really just 1% of the ones that are doing the most visible things that people are going to be observing. You know, how exact that rule is or not is, can be debated, but the expectation of we've got 3000 people in here, I should be seeing 3000 messages every day. <laughs> and may, maybe, but not from every, you know, like, it's just not, it's not, it's just not how these things work. So I think, I think it's just, I think it's the job of folks in the community space to kindly and offer this information so that folks understand how to be realistic about that. And while yes, communities can help drive sales, it can't be in a in an aggressive way because it breaks the spirit, like you said, and it, it it will kill the vibe, and it will be counterproductive for the very thing that the, the folks might be looking for in a sales sense. In your experience, because you've been in you know some different places, uh, anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to who's been a, you know helpful in your in your growth in terms of things that you you've learned and you've done, who's been helpful in your journey? Ooh, shout out to uh, Missy Query, who I worked with on the Edge team. Um, she's actually the person that taught me to be a human first in community. And uh, the reason, like, she was the reason for my transition out of the, like, corporate speak community into actually, hey, I'm the face of this company, whether I intend to be or not. Like, I'm putting myself out there. I'm on the webinars. I'm here. So people see me. People know me by name. They're going to tag me on Twitter. They're going to like DM me on Reddit and these things are all okay and acceptable and it doesn't have to be the monolithic corporate vibe instead. I think it's very important and that people, like you said, see you as a person and not just an extension or a mechanism inside of a company. And, and I, you know, quite well that for me as well, it's like the more that I can show myself as a person and be vulnerable and say like, look, I have good days and bad days. And I like doing these kind of things as well to encourage others to do the same. I think it's uh, it's something that I think is is very very helpful for folks and 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 I struggled a lot as well too in the beginning mm -hmm. with imposter syndrome and all those things but now it's something that's much easier and I can just say like well you know this is who I am and this is what I do and I may not have the answers to your questions but it's my job to create a network of different folks who can help um, when those things come up. I do want to add a bit to that before we go on, though, because you mentioned earlier, like not wanting to create the cult of personality around a specific person and not wanting to elevate the community manager to superstar status. And I think those kind of both are intention, but they make sense as well. Like you want to be present, you want to be visible, you want people to see you, but you're not the reason they come to the community. Um, and that's part of having the other voices around and whether that's internals or other community members, making sure that you're not the only one talking so that if something happens or if you're not present in the community anymore, it can still continue naturally. Absolutely. And I, I think I've, I've made many mistakes in that, as, in that regard, because they're just thinking like, there's gotta be lots and lots of noise. There's gotta, and, and yes, there does need to be, but also what are the core values and the core mission, the core objectives and how are my actions contributing to that? And, and once again, many, many learnings because of many, many mistakes. And so how I look at it now is not how I've looked at it in, in the past. And, and so anyone, one of the difficulties here though, is because, and mistakes that I also made is that I didn't read John O'Bacon and I didn't read Mary Thingball and I didn't really like go out and be like, okay, what are the resources that exist for this area? There are, it's not to say that there are few, there are actually quite a lot more and more people writing about this. And we see this also because of a lot of growth in the DevRel space, which has a lot of links with the community space. And, and you were also someone who guided me on that, that I didn't understand that, oh, there are actually quite a few different roles and, and, and elements inside this area. And that it's not just, you know, it can't in small communities, yes, it can just be one person, but that I think for anybody who's gonna get involved, take the time to go out and read and listen. There are podcasts, there are videos, there are books, there are lots of different things. And that can help alleviate some of the stress of feeling like, well, I just got to, you know, run with my instinct. And if no one's stopping me, I guess is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's different. Like you said, it does depend. Every organization is different. Every community is going to be different and they should be different because there needs to be something unique about it that people can feel 
and perceive when they get involved. It's like, oh, it's not like this one. They do actually things a little bit differently. They have different rituals. They have different celebrations. They have different ways of supporting folks. Uh, they have different frequent conversations that they're trying to get out in the open. I think, you know, embrace, you know, embrace those differences and celebrate them and, and, and make them a part of your, of your DNA. Last but not least, in that regard, regarding resources, though, for folks that are maybe new to the space, is there anything that's been helpful for you or anything that you would recommend? Ooh, I absolutely love Orbit as a community tool. And also a lot of their resources are really strong. It's an open source model and it really informed the way I think about community. It's like one of the big things is community is an ice cream cone and it like sits on top of your funnel and a lot of those folks are never going to convert. And the value is the size of the ice cream cone. Like you see someone walking by with a giant ice cream cone. You're like, I want that. Yeah. Um, so that was really helpful. And also they have sort of a method of looking at community that weights interaction more heavily than say just a view or having a person in a Slack channel is less valuable than having them, you know, show up to your webinar things like that. So it gives like a hierarchical model to think about and weight your community engagements and see the health of your community beyond just, you know, a set of numbers that you're going to look at in a dashboard. Agreed. 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 And I think that, you know, that's what they talk about, you know, love as a metric, like how do you measure love? Like, and I think, I think that's cool. And I think it's a, an exciting thing for people to to dive into and, and and make it part of their story. This is fantastic. I'm not surprised that I got a lot of healthy reminders, but also new information as well and new ideas for the, for the stuff that you're doing. You're very active, you're very thoughtful, and you're a, a very strong reminder about how, like you said, the importance of being genuine and ever since I've known you is that, yeah, you have very clear principles and there are certain things that just cannot be compromised. And I really respect that. 2023. It's not, it's, I think it's harder than it looks. Maybe it isn't hard for you, but you make it because you make it look easy. Um, Alex, thank you very much for your time today and look forward to, to what's coming next. Thank you so much for the invite. It was great to talk to you about all this. Absolutely. Pleasure. Cheers.